third general screening is recommended for a relatively healthy male as early detection before more extensive testing. Is a full blood test sufficient? And are there any specific tests that should be done? So great question. And I think that what men and women need is a kind of screening program that looks at the, the sort of the obvious pieces. Is your, your liver function, kidney function, of course, good. But if we think about it in, even in economic terms, the best screening is weight. So checking on weight, checking on blood pressure, a physical exam is a critical part of health screening and a conversation with a doctor that would include a family history. As far as blood tests go, I think it's important to look at the cholesterol panel, looking really not so much at the so-called bad cholesterol, but thinking about the triglycerides and the HDL, which if they're not in the right positions, are associated with diabetes and prediabetes and insulin resistance. When I think of cancer screening, I think of health screening because if obesity, diabetes, and metabolic disease are a driver of cancer, then I need to be screening for general health, not just cancer. Um, so, so again, that's why tumor markers don't really factor in here. So a good regular blood test, looking at chemistry, looking at hormones, markers of inflammation, markers of diabetes and insulin resistance or fatty liver, and a good conversation with a regular doctor, meaning a doctor that you have a routine and long-term relationship with. So are there screening tests that I can do at home? I think what you mentioned screening just now tests was Screening at home, <laughs> sure. Um, you should follow, you know, check your own weight. You can check your blood pressure at home. Um, other things you can do at home. Try, you know, use a device, your phone, a Fitbit, or some device to make sure that you're as active as you should be. Um, those are probably really all that could be done at home. Um, I, I think that you need to ask yourself, here's a good question. When you wake up in the morning, do you feel refreshed? Because if you don't wake up feeling refreshed, then something in the system is wrong. And that should make you rethink what lifestyle choices you make and and can you make some changes to to feel better to reduce stress uh reduce weight uh, and stay active so i have two siblings afflicted with cancer what are the chances of getting it too what precautions should we take at least to at least minimize the chances of getting it well if we draw out a family tree and we know that this person has two siblings. Um, I would say that generally, yes, there's some measurable or, or you know, appreciable increased risk compared to a family that doesn't have any cancer in it. But to answer the question accurately, we really need to know the kind of cancer, the age at onset, and very importantly, were they deadly cancers? Um, there are some family trees where cancer does happen, but people don't die from it. And certain cancers really don't have much impact on, don't have an inherited element, like the blood cancers, uh, leukemias, and, and certain, uh, you know, certain rare cancers are, are far less associated with inheritable risk. But if we're talking about, you know, two sisters with breast cancer before age 40, and you're the youngest sister, Yes, that's a real risk, and that's something for a discussion with a, a, a cancer preventive doctor, a medical geneticist, uh, a breast cancer surgeon, somebody who understands the literature and can walk you, the, the patient, through the risks and benefits and the rationale for offering or doing genetic testing to personalize your, your re risk reduction and to answer the question you've given me is, what's my statistical risk? Uh, but we can't answer it without really getting more details from, from that family tree. Hi, I want to ask what's the difference between ultrasound and mammography for breast, and which one is more important? Do you have an answer for that? Sure. Uh, as a general answer, first thing is mammograms are more important than ultrasound. 
Um, ultrasound is good for very dense breasts, but mammogram is the gold standard for screening and, uh, of breast cancer at the right age group. The difference is ultrasound uses sound waves that are going to bounce um, towards the breast and the tissue and then bounce back and be measured and give a, an echo uh, measurement. So it's, it's, it's a way of seeing the sound waves bounce back and forth and depending upon the tissue, we can identify what's more fibrous, what's uh, softer, what's more fatty, what's harder, and, and get shapes and sounds as a reverberation. Mammogram is an x-ray. It's a traditional x-ray that is looking uh, using, um, you know, uh, x-rays. Uh, so to go through the breast tissue onto a plate uh, or a digital background where we see a different set of information altogether good for looking at what we call calcifications and uh, fibrocystic changes, different things. It's really two completely and complementary techniques. It's like saying if you were, I don't know, in a, in a science fiction movie, looking, being able to look at someone in the woods with, uh, you know, uh, infrared goggles to see their heat signature, as well as looking with color vision. So you get different information from two different sets of eyes in, in that way. So the next question would be, if I have a family history of different cancers, liver, breast, pancreas, colon cancer, does that mean my risk is very high? I think the, your risk is elevated. So um, the word very high is uh, a bit of an editorial. So, I mean, is it higher than mine, higher than someone else's? Hard to say very high, but I would say that a family tree that includes those cancers has the individuals in that family likely have an increased risk and I always get a little bit um, uh, motivated uh, to talk to patients when there's pancreas cancer in the family because that can have um, some inherited susceptibility and taking a good family history and understanding who had pancreas cancer and when is important because there's evolving information to suggest that we might want to start looking at people internally with MRI or CT scan when they come from a family history of pancreas cancer, the same way that we would do either MRI or mammograms earlier if you come from a strong family history of breast cancer. So pancreas usually shows up at stage four, so anything we can do to find it early, uh, I would advocate. A good rule of thumb is starting 10 years, if you know who in the families had the cancer and at what age they had the cancer, screening for others at risk should start 10 years earlier. And now, if someone had pancreas cancer at 25, I'm not gonna start at 15, but we, we really begin to think about screening in high-risk individuals when they're an adult, which is typically, probably age 25. Um, and that's not, what we're not talking about is um, childhood cancers. Um, that's a completely different and important topic uh, we should maybe do one day um, because there's a whole group of people that are the adult survivors of childhood cancer. And they have significant increased risk for future cancers, not just because of the cancer they had before, but sometimes because of the treatment of cancer that might have changed their bone marrow or exposed them to radiation so that they have an extra risk on top of what they had already been through as a, say, a teenager. Um, uh, so Richard's mother was diagnosed with breast cancer as a man in his 40s. Should I be concerned about my risk for breast cancer? So I think this is a very interesting question and applicable to so many out there. It's a great question. Men do get breast cancer. So um, it, it does happen. I think, for example, using US numbers, there's about 220, maybe 240,000 cases of breast cancer every year in the United States. Only about 2,000 to 3,000 will be male breast cancer. Only might not be the best word choice there. But the, it is a small fraction of the total breast cancer burden, but it happens. 
Now, the majority, if not the overwhelming majority of those male breast cancer cases occur in the setting of what we call and discussed hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And it is uh, not exclusive, but again, overwhelmingly common that male breast cancer is associated with a variation or mutation in the BRCA2 gene. Now, if there is no male breast cancer in the, this person's family, and there is only one breast cancer in the family, then I don't think that the individual has an elevated risk of breast cancer. But depending upon the circumstances of his mother's breast cancer, early onset or her familial risk or other cancers in the family, he may have elevated risk for pancreas or prostate or male breast, certain skin cancers as well, the cancers that go with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. So HBOC. That's what, if he wants to dig deeper, he should do a Google search on HBOC um, and see, does anything in that story fit his family story? Is there a particular cancer that is more likely to be inherited according in, like, in your own perspective and studies maybe? I would say colon cancer. Colon, colon and breast, ovarian, uh, those definitely have a, a higher risk of inheritance uh, than a lot of other cancers. Uh, the one, one view on that also includes the most common cancers in most of the developed world are colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. Three out of those four are strong, are, are, have a strong background in lifestyle metabolic health. Smoking and lung cancer are very, very clearly associated. So lung cancer is not a commonly inherited disease, but the other three, colon cancer, um, uh, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, prostate, those are those two big cancer syndromes that I talked about with the slides. And um, it, it's, it's definitely something that every oncologist sees and even good family medicine doctors know to take the history and refer those patients to specialists um, so that they can get a personalized screening program and a personalized risk reduction uh, advice. Are genetic checks invasive? I think that's a very interesting question. Like, how do you take your DNA sample? Are there more than one way? So it's, there, are, there are two common ways. Certainly a, a, just a simple blood test, like any blood test most people have ever had, a single tube of blood. But increasingly, we can uh, do all the genetic testing that one would need from just a, a cheek swab, a, a Q-tip on the inside of your mouth, uh, brush it around, just like, you know, one of the TV shows, you know, where they're going to find criminals based on DNA. But we can, we can just do a cheek swab and also scan DNA for inherited susceptibility to cancer and other chronic diseases. Just wondering whether you could like take a hair sample that kind of thing or not yet. <laughs> now there is something I didn't talk about tonight that is coming. Um, I, I, I wouldn't call it controversial. It's just not ready for prime time. And that is um, we can look at something called circulating free DNA as a potential screening test for many, many cancers. Sometimes this is also called a liquid biopsy. It's a technique we use in people with advanced or metastatic cancer to monitor disease. But, and it works because it turns out cancer cells, tumors, shed this abnormal DNA into our blood. And it, with, a, with a blood test, we can separate the, the normal DNA that the, the patient got from mom and dad from the cancer DNA that is similar but just slightly different and almost like a, a subtraction from the normal to the abnormal, you can see the changes that, that exist in the cancer. And so there are a couple of companies racing to uh, bring these tests to market for uh, health screening. Uh, one is available in the US. Um, it's not yet quite in Asia, but these will be game changers. I'm excited for them, but I'm also scared because 
I worry about what I call stage minus one cancer. Everybody's got in their head stage four or stage two, and but I worry about patients coming in and getting one of these very advanced blood tests that says there's something abnormal here. And then we're gonna do a colonoscopy and a scope and a PET scan and a MRI. We're gonna do all sorts of tests and we might not find a visible tumor. So for me, that's a recipe for anxiety. Um, I really don't want a blood test that says I've got a problem, but I can't find it. Um, it really goes against all of the principles of screening um, because we only screen for things that we actually know how to, that we have treatments for and really could make a difference in how long and how well people live. But they're trying to prove that with these tests and they will be something available um, uh, for all of us in the, in, in literally in months to years. So that's a liquid biopsy and, and we, we can talk about those when they become a little more uh, widely available. Can a cyst result in cancer formation? There was a cyst that the person had removed from the upper gum last November. Results showed that it was non-cancerous, non. Will there be any chance that such a cyst will return and result in the formation of cancer in the future? I'm going to go with very, very unlikely. Um, so they, they took it out and most cysts are not cancer. Uh, there are certain cysts uh, internally that might transform into cancer or precancer, but they have to get very, very big first. That's so, which means that they've been growing a long time. But my answer is for this person, unlikely, probably no. My aunt has breast cancer already operated on, but the cancer reoccurred and is spreading to the lung and the brain. Is there any suggestions for the prevention of cancers? I need to know for precaution, I believe likely for herself. Well, depending upon her age, um, you know, she, she should do what we talked about earlier in terms of, um, you know, the routine uh, health check that would assess metabolic risk for chronic disease, including cancer. And if she's of the right age, um, then we would talk about, you know, mammograms and, and ultrasound for screening for breast cancer. If there are other family members who have breast cancer, then maybe even at a young age, we would be recommending an MRI uh, of screening of the breasts because, uh, again, in, in familial breast cancer, we don't, if you're waiting until 40 or 45 or 50 for mammograms, where you have a strong family history, that's a mistake. Those family, those individuals from those strong family histories should start with an MRI of the breast, typically beginning at about age 25. So the answer is really dependent upon her age and her aunt is not a first degree relative. So that helps reduce her risk. But if there are other family members, um, then, then she might have more risk than she realizes. Uh, the next question also related to breast cancer. I've been going for a yearly mammogram and a six monthly ultrasound since 2018. Found a lump on the left breast and a cyst on the right. Generally, they said the lump is now a C minus C2 tumor. What should I do? Do I need a biopsy and what are the risks? A C2, I, I'm not sure what they mean by the C2. Um, and, and again, we really need age to know what to do with yeah. this. Um, yeah. that, that's really the, the, the challenge here. But um, again, depending upon age and depending upon what the, the imaging looks like, sometimes an MRI is a good way to tell the difference between whether a biopsy is needed or not. And sometimes, um, you know, finding the right breast surgeon with enough experience to say that, this is something we can watch and not worry about, that it's a normal age-related change in the breast, or maybe there's a reason that a biopsy should be done earlier. So we're short some information to give a, 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 a good answer here, um, but it sounds like she's being monitored closely and um, hopefully with good reason. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully she doesn't- Colorectal cancer. I do not have family history, but I'm on a rather protein-heavy diet. 40 female. Are uh, her risk high? 
So I think this is a diet related question. So I think it's quite interesting. So I wouldn't say that a protein rich diet is uh, a specific risk for colon cancer. There are some studies, not always of the best quality, but certainly some large nutritional studies that suggest that red meat might be more of a risk for colon cancer. But the question here didn't say red meat, it said protein. And so a lot of people confuse the increase in vegetarianism and veganism and plant-based as well as the negativity that comes with animal-based products and, and animal-based protein, they, they confuse these issues. And it, the issue is, you know, I, I'm all for a balanced diet. I'm, I, 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 you know, think we need to eat fewer carbohydrates, fewer processed food, less food probably overall, but I'm an omnivore and uh, like to have, you know, all sorts of animal protein as well as vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. But what patients often confuse is if they're told to eat less red meat, they think they need to eat less animal protein. And if you're eating less animal protein, you're probably eating more carbohydrates. So I think that you have to find the right balance between your total protein intake and your carbohydrate intake. I don't think that a protein rich diet, which could be like even a carnivore diet, I don't think that that on its own merit is an increased risk for cancer. I think you have to frame that risk in the presence of, are you overweight? Do you have fatty liver? Do you have diabetes or insulin resistance? Because those will be more important than what the macronutrient you know, uh, choice in your diet is, whether you're protein rich or, or balanced. I think you have to know that you're metabolically fit in the first place. Music